Hello, I'm Scott Thompson and welcome to After 10. Providing aid to developing nations isn't just about providing handouts. It's also about supporting science and technology education in those countries. With that in mind, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon recently established a scientific advisory board that will begin full-scale operations this year. On today's After 10, we hear more about the board and its mission with one of its members, Min dong -pil. The United Nations has established a scientific advisory board to the UN Secretary General in order to give full-scale support for developing nations in the field of science and technology. The very first advisory board is comprised of 26 specialists from a variety of fields. One of them is a Korean professor of science. He is Professor Min Tong Pil. As a former ambassador for science and technology cooperation, Professor Min Dong Pil has put much effort into promoting Korea's work in the field to the world. Meet Professor Min Dong Pil, who has strived to find economic balance between developing and advanced nations through science and technology. Professor Min, thank you very much for being on the program. Thank you for having me. And first of all, congratulations on your new appointment to the Scientific Advisory Board. Why did UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, decide to establish this board? As you know, the science and technology advances very quickly. And uh, most of uh, political leaders and the policy makers, they must uh, know uh, what is the, uh, the rapid progress of the science in order to make their decision on the, the each important issues. So uh, this is for the, also for the Ban Ki-moon, UN Secretary General, who is supposed to give uh, relevant uh, advices and also provide some leadership to those political leaders. Uh, and then uh, he must give us some argument and rationals so that uh, these political leaders should use in order to convince their people. So the uh, role of this, uh, this science advisory board must be provide all the arguments, scientific arguments and rationals that uh, these political leaders should uh, be quite familiar with. And uh, this is the reason why the uh, political leaders and uh, policy makers must be very in intimate relationship with the science society. And uh, they must be in current of the discussions that the science society is doing now. So this is a kind of role of being an ear of uh, Ban Ki-moon and also they provide some uh, rational or thinking thought and also to provide what's the consequence of his decision afterwards. So this is quite a complex uh, duty. So you and the other members of this board will be advising you and Secretary, uh, Secretary General Bond on these scientific issues. What has the Secretary General uh, said that he expects from the board? Uh, it's uh, to be discussed uh, uh, from the beginning. But uh, whenever he has uh, some kind of issues to consider, he will provide us, I mean, he will ask us to prepare. Then we will prepare uh, for him to make a right decision. And I understand this board is c composed of 26 members. Uh, tell us a little bit about who they are. Uh, it's uh, the board is uh, this quite well evenly distributed, depending on the continents and also the uh, fields and also even the in the gender so yeah 13 of them are men and the 13 of them are women but uh, that represents the complexities of uh, a problem that we have to face with so uh, very many things are related interrelated and uh, cross disciplinary so that uh, they represent from i mean some some are the chemists, some are physicists, and some are biologists. And also even the, uh, in order to rep 
deflect the the regional interest and also the uh, continent uh, problem issues. So uh, this is uh, five from, for example, Europe, five from Africa, and uh, nine from Asia, including Middle East, and so forth. So it's uh, very evenly distributed in order to make a discussion uh, reflecting all the various aspects of the problems. And the first meeting of this advisory board is uh, set to take place on January 30th and the 31st in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, why, why Germany? Why was Germany selected? As you know, there is one organization taking care of education, science, and culture, which is UNESCO. So uh, it is quite natural to have a close relationship with the UNESCO and the Science Advisory Board. That's the reason why Ban Ki-moon asked uh, to uh, Director General of UNESCO, Irina Bokova, to compose this Science Advisory Board. So, and the uh, uh, German uh, UNESCO Commission invited uh, our meeting for the first, I mean, for the inaugural meeting to Berlin and uh, this is a good example. This shows a good example how to support this uh, advisory board activities from each country. And this is going to be the very first meeting of this advisory board. Uh, what can we expect from the meeting in Berlin? Uh, first of all, we must shape up the, uh, the range of the activities and also the, uh, what kind of uh, uh, decision uh, channel, I mean structure of this board. So uh, I think this will be discussed in the first meeting. And then uh, with this structure, then we'll work on <laughs> the duty, our duty. Okay. Um, in looking at your resume, uh, you've been a professor of nuclear physics. You've been in charge of about 10 national institutes. You uh, have been involved in shaping the nation's scientific policies as well. But there's one thing that uh, doesn't look like the others. You're, you're currently working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which begs the question, what is the relationship, what is the link between diplomacy and, uh, and science and technology? I learned that the science diplomacy has a three different aspects. One is for the develop, uh, development of the science uh, by the diplomacy. And the one is the uh, development of the uh, diplomacy by uh, the science. But nowadays, more and more, we must consider to solve the uh, global issues such as climate changes and uh, the CO2 emission, which we call the science uh, in diplomacy. And uh, uh, the basic uh, importance, I mean the real importance of this science in this diplomacy is it stems from the fact that uh, science creates the wealth of the country. And uh, this is a basic of uh, development of each country for their prosperity. That's the reason why the uh, important, I mean, the science become more and more important in the relationship with uh, other countries. Could you perhaps give us some specific examples of scientific and technical cooperation working hand in hand with national security and diplomacy? Well, I can cite two examples. One is uh, the example of China. For example, when they open the, uh, their gate to uh, the United States, they start with cooperating on uh, scientific activities. That means uh, China asked to the uh, United States to build one accelerator. And this accelerator in Beijing University is still working very nicely so that they produce a lot of uh, high quality research re results. And the second must be the, for example, this very being, I mean, it's a very uh, uh, happening uh, nowadays is that uh, there is one uh, f huge project such as a Future Earth project. 
which is uh, a project uh, where the old uh, science uh, academic societies of, uh, of each country participate. So it's a huge project to solve global issues of the future Earth. So this opened the gate of all country to uh, let their scientists participate together and uh, they discuss together so that uh, even the Israel and uh, also the, uh, the Iran scientists, they work together inside of this program. So the scientific cooperation opens the door then for uh, diplomatic exchanges That's down right. the line, right? Yeah. Um, you are the former ambassador for science and technology cooperation. Um, you have a lot of experience with, uh, with cooperation uh, with underdeveloped mm -hmm. countries. It's one of the reasons why you are on, mm -hmm. uh, on the scientific advisory board. Um, what is the ideal way of, uh, of giving mm -hmm. science and technology assistance, support, to these developing countries? I was a scientific, I mean, the, the science and technology cooperation ambassador of Korea. And the, during that, my duty, I have put my efforts to establish kind of network between uh, Korean science society with the, uh, some science society of developing countries. I know that uh, from our experience that they need some friends to discuss with, frankly, what they are thinking of and what uh, they could express themselves, what they need. So uh, this will uh, help them to find out their problems and to find out their solutions. So this is the way that uh, future collaboration must be. Uh, that's the reason why the Korea even though we have uh, very accumulated knowledge and experience, because we have passed through uh, all this period to make our country uh, much more uh, with uh, prosperity in a very short time. Uh, but nevertheless, these issues are very new. So, uh, uh, one must be very creative to handle all the issues that uh, these developing countries is facing now. So once uh, the Albert Einstein said uh, that uh, one cannot find a solution with the same thoughts that the uh, problem was created. So we need to be creative to help those developing countries. It's not just providing the known technology to them. It's to work together and uh, with the spirit of the partnership. As you mentioned, Korea has been down this road before. It's the first nation to turn from a, a nation requiring um, assistance to one that is actually giving assistance, giving mm. aid. Um, with that in mind, what sort of assistance, what sort of support mm -hmm. are these developing countries looking for from Korea when, when they seek out help? Well, uh, they must uh, be in need of knowing a lot of technology and also a lot of know-how, how to cultivate their capacity. So. Uh, they must ask us a lot of uh, different aspects. But nevertheless, what is important is that uh, uh, we must think about how to educate the next generation. That means how to cultivate those highly educated person the, and also the uh, trained workforce for their industrial development. So uh, this is the uh, way that uh, we have to help them and uh, this is the way they must uh, pay attention to. And Korea has been very active and will continue to be very active in, in giving this support to these, uh, these nations. Um, looking at some of the achievements mm -hmm. from what Korea has done in these countries, what, what are some of these achievements? Uh, well, I think uh, we started to help them quite recently. I mean, we become a giver, I mean, donor country 
from only 19, uh, 2009. So our experience is not yet uh, amply accumulated yet. But uh, I hope that uh, Korea find out some uh, leadership in this program of helping others. So, for example, one, uh, but nevertheless, I can cite some, some examples that uh, uh, these countries, developing countries, they have uh, natural resources, but which uh, contains a lot of CO2 issues and also the pollution issues also. So they, need, uh, they asked us the transfer of technology on the carbon burning and also some waste burning. So that's the, uh, the perspective that, I mean, the, uh, the important points that we can help them, first of all, to solve their present issues. But later, certainly we should draw their attention towards uh, uh, manpower education. There have been achievements, and many countries look at Korea as being exa an example for, for how to uh, really go about doing these things. Uh, Gretchen Kalanji, the assistant, uh, the assistant Director General for UNESCO, said at a 2012 uh, Seoul Science and Technology mm -hmm. Forum that the concept mm -hmm. of aid uh, being proposed and provided by Korea is really innovative mm -hmm. uh, in the way that Korea is going about it. Um, how is Korea different? Um, what separates it from these other countries that are doing similar things in these countries? Uh, first of all, uh, we are very close to them because we have just passed through that kind of period. So we have uh, many information and experience how to solve their issues. Okay. The, those advanced countries, they graduated already <laughs> from that period. So we can provide them uh, a knowledge for those countries of the uh, transitional and transformative period of their p development. So, and that the, the next thing must be the, that must be that uh, they want us to play a kind of mediator, kind of advocate between the developed and developing countries. But most of uh, the important thing is that uh, we have uh, intention to help them being a partner. So we want to discuss from the beginning and create a project from the beginning and to find out the uh, inspiring way out, I mean solutions together. That's perhaps the Dr. Gretchen Kalonji was uh, touched by. <laughs> the, the, that unique perspective that Korea has because yeah. it hasn't been that long since Korea was in that situation. Mm -hmm. right? um, for all the achievements, for all the progress that there's been, uh, there's always more that can be done. Mm. Uh, what more can be done? Where, where can improvements be made? Uh, you know, everything depends on the budget that we have to put. I mean, we have a uh, lot of intention, but uh, also we need a lot of uh, financial support. So it is quite limited. But one, one thing is to find, is important thing is to find out what is the effective and efficient way how to use our finite natural resources and uh, this uh, support. Uh, to find out uh, new solutions. So, as I mentioned, we need to be very creative. And this is the uh, way uh, to tackle with the uh, creative economy of our government. I mean, nobody has uh, infinite resources. <laughs> uh, with the finite resources, how to solve the uh, issues in front of us. This need uh, creativity. Um, as you mentioned, it needs creativity. It also needs uh, funding. It needs money. That's right. uh, a lot of it. Um, but as you mentioned there, I think briefly, there are benefits to Korea as well going through uh, through this process, right? That's right. You know, world is quite uh, globalized already. 
So every member, every, every, every person is already the citizen of the world. The Korea, that, I mean, by helping them, will have a benefit from, from them. The Korea will be the market of those countries, developing countries in the near future. And they are our market also. So it's a quite interconnected. So we need to have a much globalized thinking. Uh, so I think the uh, benefits of this collaboration and uh, this help uh, should be judged by the long-term perspective, not a short-term perspective. It's, uh, we need a spirit of uh, sowing seed. So in near future, we'll get our fruits with, uh, by sharing, uh, share with those countries. And, and you also mentioned this, this has an effect uh, on the creative economy push as mm. well. What kind of effect are we talking about? Uh, you know, we need, uh, we, we need uh, some manpower. Does our students or young generation need a lot of experiences to confront with the uh, this actual issues of the world. When they are trained in our universities or in, uh, in Korea, they could not think about what's, uh, what's happening in the other side of the world. So this will provide them a kind of test bed for their new experience, new uh, entrepreneurship, and also your new uh, challenges. So uh, this will provide them a lot of uh, capacity that is uh, quite helpful to our creative economy and the most essential factor of our creative economy. As a member of this newly established scientific advisory board, I imagine you're going to be quite busy over the coming months. What are your plans for 2014? First of all, I hope to fulfill my mission, the mandate of the uh, SAB, as I mentioned. Uh, this is to give, provide the UN Secretary General the most relevant uh, scientific uh, information and arguments. Uh, and the secondly, I hope to uh, help Korea to find out the uh, new leadership in uh, these ODA activities, uh, helping others uh, through this mission of being a science advisory board. Professor Min will certainly be looking forward to all the board has in store for the coming months and years. Thank you very much for being on the program. We appreciate it. It's my great pleasure. And thank you as always for watching. We'll see you next time after 10.